Anyway, let us start. Today we are talking about Isabella d'Este. Oh, morning, Sue. I was just talking about yoga and how lovely it is. Sue um, does yoga. I'm going to turn off comments and, and let's begin. Okay, Isabella d'Este, Isabella d'Este. Why is she somebody that many art historians are completely obsessed with? Um, well, several reasons. She was an extraordinary woman, though of that there is absolutely no doubt. She, um, she was born in 1474. Um, and died 64 years later, there you go, work it out, um, 39, 1539, um, and, um, and was, um, so she was one of the ruling classes, but what made her really important, or quite not important, but special, was that she was extraordinarily intelligent, and she was involved in politics. She was even um, regent for a time between uh, after her husband died and before her son um, gained his majority. Um, she um, was absolutely a patron of the arts, both um, as, a, as a collector and somebody who commissioned works. She was a fashionista my goodness was she interested in fashion to the point when um that uh, ladies from the french court actually followed what isabella d'este was wearing so her her reach was far and wide and perhaps the most important or one of the most important things of all was that she was a prolific letter writer and what that means is that we can be interested in her and we can gain information about her because she wrote so many letters so isabella d'este let me bring up an image of her so here she is maybe sort of you will learn as we go through the um, um this video this morning this live this morning that maybe the way that she appears in um in sculptures and in paintings isn't quite the way that she looked perhaps so this is from 1498 she's been married at this point for eight years um so she's um 24 and this is by a sculpture called Jean Cristofo Romano. So that is sort of maybe-ish, kind of in the ballpark of what she looked like. This is um, this is only in terracotta. Unfortunately, it um, so this is a preparatory sculpture. It was worked up in marble. Or carved in marble uh, but that marble bust has now very sadly been lost. So She's been married for eight years to Francesco II of Gonzaga. So he is the uh, Marquise of Mantua. So she becomes the Marchioness of Mantua. But she has known that she is going to be married um, for quite some time. In fact, for the age of six, she knew that she was going to marry Francesco the second of Gonzaga and that's not because they were childhood sweethearts and uh, you know um, kind of you know pledged themselves to each other of course it wasn't not uh, not back in 15th 16th century Italy as we would now call it um, they were it was an arranged marriage and um, she came from an important family in Ferrara um, and was very cultured um it said that by the time she was six she could speak greek and latin uh so she was quite desirable and the gonzaga family spotted this and they um, asked that she could be betrothed to their son uh francesco um as i say when she was six they married 10 years later um, and she arrived in Mantua then in 1490. So she arrived in Mantua and I don't think this was a particularly horrific occasion for her. Um, 
she i think she had corresponded a little bit with with francesco and they they found uh, quite a bit in common and when she arrived she was given of course her own apartments and this meant that she could really start to properly carve her niche out in in life um which she she really did so she was given her apartments and she had her she created a studiolo which we spoke about on monday if any of you um have, have watched the the monday session or joined the monday session um so the studiolo was it sort of translates as a studio but um it's not a, a private space it was absolutely a room where you would completely show off so um, painting some Antenna painted a couple of allegories such as the Triumph of the Virtues we discussed on Monday for Isabella's Studiolo um, and then just kind of other other treasures both expensive and um, showing off your erudition and intelligence and then beneath that she had a, a room with a vaulted ceiling that she called her grotta and in there she um, she housed her antiquities she was an avid avid collector of antiquities um, quite un unusually for women that was normally considered to be a, a masculine pastime so she was quite feisty and knew her mind right from the start, Isabella d'Este. I'm going to read um, just a, a very short quote from a letter, one of her famous letters, that she wrote to an unknown Mantuan artist. It wasn't Mantegna. She wrote, so this must have been when she was having her studiolo created. We are glad to hear that you're doing your utmost to finish our studiolo, our she uses that for just herself, our studiolo, so as not to be sent to prison. You can paint whatever you like inside the cupboards as long as it is not anything ugly because if it is you will have to paint it all over again at your own expense. Um, so <laughs> she yeah, she she knew what she wanted and um, I don't know whether she knew how to get it, you know, if you don't do what I want then I'm going to send you to prison. Um, <clears throat> Um, but we can, yes, yeah, so we can, we can see that she was already by her late teens, um, a, a bit of a, a force to be reckoned with. And so you would imagine that maybe when she arrived in Mantua, um, she wouldn't have waited eight years to have her likeness, um, portrayed either in a painting or in, in sculpture. And you would be right. Uh, so when she arrived in Mantua, the natural artist for her to go to to commission a portrait was Mantegna, of course. So court artist um, painted for her studiolo um, and he had been the court artist um, for over 40 years by this time to the, to the, um, to the Marquis and the Dukes of Mantua. So Mantegna painted her portrait, but in fact, unfortunately for us, he didn't paint it for, um, or Isabella wasn't intending to keep the portrait, she was intending to send it to a girlfriend, um, and <laughs> didn't ever get sent. Um, because she writes to the girlfriend, again, these fantastic letters, she writes to the girlfriend that um, that she can't send it because the painter had done such a terrible job that it looks nothing like us and so she'd have to commission a foreign artist. Again, I don't think she was non-binary using the um, the us, I think this is just the way that, that she spoke. Um, so she rejected, she rejected Mantegna's portrait of her, um, probably because it was too much of a likeness, in fact. Um, as we as we go on, basically, I'm talking about her through her her portraits. Um, as we go on, you'll see that that she favoured things that were rather flattering. Um, so she did get a foreign artist. This is a, a by the by, but she did get a foreign artist to paint her. This portrait, unfortunately, is now lost. The foreign artist was Giovanni Santi, who you probably haven't heard of, but you will have heard of his son Raphael. So throughout her life, she had extraordinary connections to most of the, the great artists of the, of the um, 15th, 16th century. She never, ever allowed Mantegna to paint her again. So you painted these allegories, that's fine, um, but 
even in a religious piece in which she was supposed to sit as a donor alongside uh, Francesco II of Gonzaga, her husband, um, no, she, uh, she, she point blank refused. So Mantegna was out. As I said, she wasn't interested in being portrayed maybe exactly as she was. She was interested more in projecting an image. Image she knew that um, that she could really control her um, her the way that people thought about her through the manipulation essentially of the images that she sent out into the world. So by the same guy, so the this one by um, Romano, this coin also with her bust on it was also commissioned by the same artist Romano um, and you know and so she is sending this out you know she has gravitas she probably thinks that she looks quite attractive here um, on the back there's an image of a, a sort of a, a goddess with these um, star sign for Sagittarius so all meaningful for her um, and she had a lot of these cast in bronze and gave them out to, to, to gifts as, uh, to gifts to, to friends and to, to people that she probably wanted favours from um, um, and this one she had cast in gold for herself a rather beautifully surrounded uh, with diamonds and enamel so Yes, definitely, definitely knew the power of the image, did Isabella d'Este, not only for when she was alive, but also I think she was already quite aware of her legacy in, in death. So, forward thinking. So, therefore, when in 1499, Leonardo da Vinci had to leave Milan in a bit of a hurry, so he just, if you've been watching any of my other videos, he just finished painting The Last Supper in the late 1490s. And then 1499, the French were about to invade Milan, and so he fled, and he fled to the court of Isabella d'Este. And whilst he was there, this is what he did. So he painted this rather gorgeous um, drawing. He painted this gorgeous drawing. He didn't paint a drawing at all. He drew Isabella d'Este um, uh, twice, actually. So one copy uh, he kept for himself and one she kept. Um, this so this was in around about 1499 um, to 1500 the mona lisa was painted in 1500 um, 1503 so potentially people uh, art historians like to say that this was a precursor to the mona lisa um, certainly the, the the shoulders and the and the torso were in quite a, a similar position to to the Mona Lisa, but the, the head here um, for Isabella d'Este is in profile, of course, which it isn't in the, in, with the Mona Lisa. Um, but it's it's a portrait that, or it's a drawing that she obviously liked very much. Um, I think she quite liked the fact that it flattered her, you know, these big sleeves hid the fact that she'd got uh, quite chubby well she'd had two children by this point she was to go on to have another six children um so she had eight in total six of whom survived um and the the profile portrait was the fashion at the time until leonardo changed it um uh so she's yeah she looks she looks quite nice she's got gravitas and she doesn't look too huge which was <laughs> as did a forefront in her mind um so off Leonardo went after just a few months and we know that she wrote him a lot of letters begging him to, um, to work this up into a proper portrait. Now, I don't know whether any of this is ringing a bell. It might be, even if you aren't remotely, well, if you're going to say if you're not remotely interested in art history if you're not remotely interested then maybe you wouldn't be watching this but even if normally you wouldn't be interested in art history this might be ringing a bell because in 2013 a painting was found in a Swiss vault that was thought to perhaps have been the uh, painting that Leonardo worked up of his drawing um, so 
here we go. So we've got them side by side there. Uh, let's just bring up, actually, let's just bring up the, the painting. So this was found in 2013 and it's still being discussed. Um, so essentially there are, the, there are some art historians that think that this is definitely, um, well, it's definitely Isabella d'Este. I think, I think that it's fairly certain that, we can see them both together, that this painting was taken from this drawing. The, the likenesses are too uncanny. However, is it in fact um, a painting by Leonardo's hand um, from this drawing? That is very much in dispute. The things that suggest that it might be, the pose is the same, um, it, the, the painting has been analysed and it's from the correct time period, pigments and um, the, the preparation of the, the, the pigments correspond to the ways that we know um, Leonardo painted. Um, there is, so on, the, on the, the drawing, which you can't see because it's now been cut off, there was originally, um, Isabella was sort of pointing subtly to a book. Um, showing her erudition um, and that is also included in underpaints so it's not um, visible today but um, with photography special photography and so on we can see that there was a book included in in the right position so all this suggests that maybe Leonardo did paint this work um, the the sort of frond thing, the thing that she's holding is in fact a martyr's palm and then I don't know whether you can see but down um, sort of down to the, the lower right hand side of the painting is what looks like a, a, a wheel so mm, they've turned Isabella d'Este into St Catherine, seems a bit odd. Um, the wheel and the palm and the crown I think were added at a, a later date so probably what happened um, because there was, for starts, we know that Leonardo wasn't particularly interested in painting at this point. He painted the Mona Lisa and then that was kind of it. He, he'd moved on to other things and, and the, the letters from Isabella continue to ask him to paint her portrait after 1503. Um, and none of these letters ever ever suggest that he has in fact complied with her wishes so this is kind of a big negative as to Leonardo actually painting this um, Leonardo this is painted on canvas Leonardo preferred to paint on wood um, so there's kind of there's this things kind of that are against this this line of thought so probably probably what happened was that um, Leonardo was getting all these letters said to his workshop right we're going to have to you know we're going to have to paint this this painting this image of Isabella d'Este um, got somebody or several of his workshop to work up this this portrait um, and then just thought oh, actually no it's just it's not good enough to send her and so didn't send it added in the martyr's palm and the Catherine wheel afterwards so that it could be sold um, just on the on the open market um, and I'm just going to show you where I got some of this information from here we go this is Lorenzo Bondol, um, Bonaldi's book about Isabella d'Este and some of that information is in this book so thank you to him it's great um, you can get it on Amazon uh, so, so yes, the mystery of the Leonardo painting that it is still raging and now I think there's a legal battle over who actually um, owns this painting. Um, yeah. So Isabella died in 1539. But that is not before she was painted by another great master and that was Titian. So I'm going to show you the portrait of Isabella d'Este by Titian and this was painted in around about 1534 she died in 1539 age 64 yeah can you see the problem here mm, the curious thing about Isabella d'Este is her she becomes younger and younger in her portraits as time goes on <laughs> it's, it's incredible isn't it she just didn't want to um, be portrayed in any kind of negative light I think um, and 
this is this is interesting because in fact she, she didn't sit for for Titian for this portrait um she sent him a portrait by a gentleman called Francesco Francia uh, that was painted in I think 1511 so quite a, a long time before this um and that painting itself was based on not her sitting um so it wasn't she didn't sit for it but that painting itself was based on this work, which was by Lorenzo Costa, um, this is 1508 or 1511, I can't remember, um, but this was her favourite portrait of herself. So this portrait was used to paint a portrait that was then sent to Titian, and then Titian painted this portrait. Yeah, so don't take images of Isabella d'Este um, to, to heart. She, she probably did look that fierce, and the colour of her hair is right. Um, she asked um, in an earlier portrait to have her eyes lightened, uh, which Titian has done here, so he is definitely flattering her. Um, but if this is her favourite portrait, then you can, you can see that she wasn't much attached to, uh, to the reality of image, shall we say. So there we go, I'm going to put comments back on. That is Isabella d'Este. I clearly had a lot to say about her because um, it's 11.23, but I hope you enjoyed that. I think she's kind of, she's kind of worth it. Um, she's kind of worth it. I, you know, I, gosh, goodness knows what she'd be doing today. Mm -hmm.